Well, welcome and thank you all for joining us, uh, especially if you're joining us live on what is a beautiful day in which there are many other things to do. But we're delighted that you've chosen to be here. My name is Eleanor Gray and uh, this is one of a weekly series by the Chambers, 39 Ch Essex Chambers Public Law Group. Generally, Chambers have been producing a large number of topical and interesting webinars during this period and we do hope that you might want to browse through the archive at some point and that you'll find useful material there. But today, over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to cover the following topics. Um, first of all, an update on processing and sharing health data in the context of the pandemic by myself. I hope that some of you will already know me as a barrister who practices primarily in the field of health regulation, but that includes work on data protection and freedom of information in the health sector and also beyond it. And now looking at my talk, it may be focusing on some relatively familiar and also less than exciting topics. Fortunately, my colleagues are going to be looking at some of the issues which are more controversial and in the press daily. So firstly, Rory Dunlop, Queen Council, Queen's Council, is going to talk about the hot topic of contact tracing and privacy. Rory is a specialist on information rights and data protection. Then last but far from least, Tom Tabori is going to speak about misinformation, freedom of expression and COVID-19. Tom's a public law barrister with expertise in areas that include human rights law, education law, electoral law, information rights and regulatory law. Um, Tom is actually currently in a hearing before a judge, um, having judgment handed down, I think. So he's not, in fact, on this call at this very moment. And I just mentioned that because you may see him pop up on a screen before we get to his talk towards the end of this session. Um, at the end of the talks, there should be some time for questions and answers. You can use the Zoom question and answer box, I think on the bottom left of your screen, to submit, que to submit questions during the course of our talks. We'll do our best to answer those that we can in the time available, although we can't give specific legal advice during a webinar. So that's uh, what I wanted to say by way of an introduction and moving on to what I wanted to say. This is about, as I said, processing health data in the time of COVID, and it's, it's a bit of a general update. The um, sharing of information relating to health is always a sensitive topic, uh, not least because health information, as you know, constitutes sensitive personal data or special category data, as we must call it under the GDPR. So it's always attracted special protection and the legal and reputational risks of mishandling it are high. On the other hand, the need to share information about actual or potential outbreaks of COVID-19 is also high. Both private and public sector organisations must do so, whether to manage health from a public health perspective or to manage the risks to staff, contractors and customers as the economy opens up again and people return to places of work and gather in public spaces. So I want to talk about some aspects of this. I'm not going to talk about contract tracing, however. As I said in the, in the introduction, my colleague Rory is covering this. Uh, before I outline what I want to speak about in more detail, um, the usual disclaimer, I'm afraid. Um, in addition, in a short talk, what I say is necessarily very brief and so may have some gaps. But what I would like to talk about firstly is just a recap about processing health information amongst the GDPR with apologies to, to those for whom this is very familiar territory. I want to point to some useful resources for the current challenges that you might be facing, and that's primarily, of course, on the informa Information Commissioner's site. I want to talk about the ICO's recovery advice to organisations about opening up and going back to work, and specifically testing staff at work, and there's also further guidance or developments about sharing health-related information. So just to start with that recap, um, I'm sure that those who are listening to this will know that the GDPR does define health data, and I won't go through its wide definition. 
It's considered to be sensitive by its nature, so its processing is prohibited, and that's Article 9.1 of the GDPR, unless processors can identify exemptions that allow processing, and that, of course, is Article 9.2. In some contexts, that uh, legitimate uh, exemption could be based on explicit consent, but that may well not be wide enough to cover public health needs or be appropriate in an employer-employee context where there's an imbalance of power and an absence of true consent. So this means consideration of when you're looking at processing health data. Firstly, of course, Article 6 GDPR, that's the lawful basis of processing for all types of data, but also for the exemptions under Article 9.2 for processing special category data. So under Article 9.2, the most useful exemptions are likely to be well, I've mentioned explicit consent and its uh, limitations, but perhaps more usefully processing in the field of employment, social security and social protection, if authorized by national law, that's the exemption under B. Providing health or social care services, uh, again, uh, looking again at the member state uh, legal protections as well, that's H. Processing for reasons of public interest in the area of public health, that's little i, and scientific research. And because of the requirement for a basis for these processing uh, activities under member states law, when considering little b, h, i, and g, you must also consider the associated conditions set out in Schedule 1 of the DPA 2018. So in relation to employment, there's a, a long definition of uh, the uh, necessary purposes, and you must also have an appropriate policy document in place. For health purposes, the processing must be necessary for a wide series of medical purposes, both looking at care and treatment, and also more broadly, the management of healthcare systems or services or social care systems or services. So that's obviously of real importance uh, for healthcare professionals. And there are similar definitions in relation to other categories of potential use contained in Schedule 1. Now, those conditions, of course, um, and I've cantered through them very briefly, uh, but they coexist along the other considerations that you have to be aware of, which are probably familiar ones relating to general data protection principles sitting alongside Articles 6 and 9. So the purpose limitations, the purpose for which you collect data, security measures, storing the data, limiting access, data minimization and retention periods, and transparency and information and privacy notices to those whose information is being held. And the appropriate policy document that I've mentioned is basically a tool for working through those issues and demonstrating compliance with each one. Now that's uh, probably a galloping canter, if I can mix my metaphors, through themes that you know, but the points I've been trying to perhaps bring out are that the GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018 already contain very wide permissive categories that should enable the use of health data to here combat, uh, to combat a pandemic. Now we'll look at uh, what some of the bodies that are regulating the use of information have been, what they've been saying. But the general thrust of these statements has been a desire to highlight that data protection law shouldn't be seen as a barrier to effective steps to combat coronavirus. That doesn't mean that its protections or its processes can be ignored, but rather that properly apply and effective policies can be devised. And more specifically, the important issue always to highlight is the need for thought before you process and the need for appropriate documentation before doing something new. And I'll come back to that. Going on, uh, despite the uh, rather gloomy slide that I've chosen with ICO enforcement officers coming in in a rather heavy handed fashion, um, I, I wanted to highlight that there are useful resources as ever on the ICO website. 
And the first thing there is a general statement of approach during the coronavirus. And that is something which is a positive statement insofar as it highlights that the ICO will be focusing on the most severe threats to the public. Now, that's not an invitation to throw the GDP baby out of the window. And there's no regulatory bonfire going on either. The requirements of the GDPR and the DPA haven't been suspended. But on the other hand, the ICO is saying that if you have genuine problems about, for example, complying with time limits because of staff shortages, you shouldn't be expecting the ICO be, to be breathing down your neck. Although there is a, a particular requirement that hasn't been waived, and that's the one, of course, to report data breaches within the appropriate time scale. The second thing that I highlighted on that slide is the coronavirus information hub and particularly the new coronavirus recovery six data protection steps for organizations that has been put up. Uh, there's also further information about issues such as working from home or all contained or gathered in that one place, which I think is all quite useful. Looking um, at this hub in more detail, I've mentioned the general regulatory approach already, but I did want to highlight the guidance of issues or upon issues related to things that employers may be facing in reopening premises. Now, clearly the main thrust of the guidance is about the steps that you might be having to take to keep people safe. Most of the measures that an employer might be considering, such as screens or one-way systems, people who need to wear masks, those who don't, or when you do and when you do, don't, don't involve holding personal health data. But some may, and so the guidance covers issues such as the testing of staff and surveillance. Surveillance might seem a little unlikely, but I think it's been included because, for example, there could be a need or a perceived need to see if health measures are actually being followed or respected. So the ICO has dealt with these issues with a focus, as you might expect, on assessing the justification for necessity for such measures and for transparency, telling people what is being done. Now, testing at work in particular is covered in detail. And as you can see from the topic headings that I've tried to put in, there's a need to think about a data protection impact assessment to summarize all the things that arise when you're considering this issue. And they'd include the basics such as the need for any testing. Why, why do it? Who do it? Do you have, who, who, who's going to be tested? Is it everybody and, and how often? And are you testing, for example, to, in response to concerns about outbreaks or is this something about looking for asymptomatic carriers more generally? The Article 9 that condition that's been highlighted as being relevant is testing or um, processing for employment purposes linked to health and safety obligations. And that links back to what I was saying about the exemptions um, that are applicable uh, under the GDPR. But the crucial elements in any policy will first be perhaps updated information to employees, or contractors, and secondly, data security and retention policies. Who's going to be given access to this information? How is it stored secure, securely? And for how long is it being kept? These are all issues which should be not only considered, but documented. Now, the previous slides and, and what I was talking about related to health data and processing and sharing health data from an employment perspective from the wider public health and health service perspective, the government has issued directives requiring the sharing of health information for COVID-19 purposes. And I've put the details of one of the instructions on the screen. There are four of these directions from the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, and they've been issued to bodies such as NHS Digital, NHS England, health organisations, local authorities, arm's length bodies and general practitioners. And they've been issued under the Health Service Control of Patient Information Regulations 2002 and are in force until September 2021. 
2020, so, so sorry, the 30th of September of this year. And the interesting thing about them is that they actually require the sharing of patient information for very widely defined COVID-19 purposes, which are set out in the direction either by persons employed or engaged for the purposes of the health service or for persons employed or engaged or a public department or other public authority in communicable disease surveillance. And the operable word is the requiring of sharing of confidential patient information, not permitting. So it seems to me that these fit into the existing GDPR framework, firstly, by triggering the duty under Article 6, processing being necessary for compliance with a legal obligation to which the controller is subject. That's a legal obligation which bites for COVID-19 purposes. And they also establishing establish the necessity of the processing for public health purposes if we were looking at Article 9 exemptions. It's also interesting to know that they modify the obligation of confidence under Regulation 4, that's the obligation of confidence owed by healthcare professionals to keep patient information confidential. They say that anything done by a person that is necessary for the purpose of processing confidential patient information in accordance with these regulations shall be taken to be lawfully done despite any obligation of confidence owed by that person in respect of it. That's something to be found in the regulations themselves. And going back to the regulations again, there are protections set out, including removing patient identifiers so far as practicable. But the point of the directions, it seems to me, is that they create wide cover for sharing for COVID-19 purposes amongst public body bodies in the health and social care sectors. But the use of these provisions does have to be documented. So I think you've got to think about all the issues that you might normally be thinking about if you were dealing with um, appropriate policy documents. So that's, uh, I think, perhaps a, an important consideration when dealing in the public sector with sharing patient information, confidential patient information. Finally, because I've been trying to highlight useful guidance, I just wanted to mention the topic of scientific research. There's been a lot of discussion about how this has been speeded up and how scientific research is currently operating at warp speed. So for those working in this area, the publication of guidelines by the European Data Protection Board on the 21st of April of this year might be of interest. The guidelines don't make new rules, but they do a very good job of explaining what there is out there already. And they also, they start with what I think is a theme for regulators, the insistence that data protection rules don't hinder or shouldn't hinder the fight against COVID-19. So they point to the existing exemptions for processing for the purpose of scientific research, that's Article 9.2, little j, as well as the public health exemption that I was discussing under little, two, little i. The guidelines define the terms that are in use and they note the important distinction between information that was collected primarily for a scientific study or a clinical trial, so that's its primary use, and the situation when information first collected for me medical purposes is then used for scientific purposes or research purposes, so that is its secondary use. So there's a discussion which is quite an important one, I think, on the circumstances in which it may be permissible not to inform those whose data is used in this secondary way of that fact, i.e. when the information wasn't collected directly from them and permission or information given at that stage. Disproportionate effort might be a legitimate reason, depending very much on the circumstances, or the obtaining or disclosure of personal data may be expressly laid down by the member states law so we might be linking that to the directions that have been made. The guidelines then talk about issues such as precautions and safeguards such as pseudo anonymization, encryption, non-disclosure agreements as well as international transfers. There's mention here of the derogations that apply to the usual rules on ensuring the adequacy of the data protection safeguards in the country to which information is being transferred. 
it may be justifiable if transfer is necessary for important reasons of public interest. So that's an important issue when looking at international data protection transfers, given the worldwide scientific community and the real issues about transferring data out of, in particular, the European economic area or places where there aren't adequacy uh, decisions about the adequacy of other countries' data protection regimes. Well, I'm going to stop there just because of the time, although I'm conscious this has been a, a rather high level talk. But I hope that I've been able to show how existing principles are still being applied at the current time and also to point to some resources that may help in decision making. But over from that rather flat topic, perhaps to the rather hotter topic, which Rory is going to talk about of contact tracing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, I feel um, there are high expectations um, after talk um, about how interesting mine is going to be. Um, and um, also high expectations in terms of how attractive my slides will be. Um, but I'll do my best. Um, uh, I, um, why this picture? Uh, when I last presented a webinar on this topic uh, around 10 weeks ago, I focused on the risks and benefits of digital contact tracing, and in particular apps. And I, at the end, came off the fence very firmly and clearly and said, what a great thing I thought uh, the apps um, are, in particular, the centralized model that the NHS was at that time pursuing. I have since had a salutary reminder of the risks of coming off the fence because the NHS has abandoned its centralized app and it's said that it may not produce uh, any app at all until the winter and it's not a priority. Um, so uh, in this talk, I'm going to be talking a bit more about manual uh, contact tracing. Uh, there's going to be about six slides and it should take about 15 minutes. If we have time, I'll try and answer questions orally. If not, I'll try to get back to everyone who asks a question in writing afterwards. So uh, as you can see from this slide, this, this is a sort of overview. I'm going to talk about manual and digital contact tracing, and I will talk about why the NHS abandoned its app. Um, I will also talk about the benefits of contact tracing and potential issues for the future. So um, manual contact tracing. Um, manual contact tracing is actually very well established. It's been used for a very long time to deal with a large range of infectious diseases, for example, sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, the NHS has begun its manual tracing for COVID, and there is a website, NHS Track and Trace, uh, which is up and running and has been for at least a couple of weeks to manage the process. And online, you can see a privacy notice that explains how it will work. And I'm going to summarize for you some of the most interesting aspects of that privacy notice. Um, the uh, privacy notice explains that uh, people who are identified uh, as having COVID from hospital laboratory tests are sent a text message or an email and uh, they're asked to confirm and provide the data which you can see in this slide. So obviously things like name, date of birth, etc. And uh, at the end, most importantly, they're asked to provide the contact details of anyone they've been in close contact with. And um, this information is uh, used by the contact tracers and they uh, then send a text message or an email or call the contacts that are provided by the initial diagnosed people. And um, they ask the contacts about whether they've had symptoms and they provide advice to them about whether or not to self-isolate and for how long and so on. Um, and uh, if necessary, those uh, can lead to further calls to contacts of the contacts as it were. The people who are doing the contact tracing are health professionals from NHS professionals, but they are also um, non-health professionals from private companies such as Social 
uh, such, such as Circo UK and Citel Group. And the information that is collected is held on computer systems, which have been tested to make sure they're secure and kept up to date uh, to be safe from viruses. Now, um, a major issue in relation to manual contact tracing has been uh, data retention. The privacy notice says, personally identifiable information collected by NHS test and trace for people with COVID-19 symptoms is kept by Public Health England for 20 years. The personally identifiable information collected on the contacts of people with COVID-19 but who do not have any symptoms is kept by Public Health England for five years. When I read this, I had to read it again because it struck me as rather odd uh, and I wondered whether it was an error because it, it seems to have as its focus COVID symptoms rather than having COVID. And if I've read it right, it implies that if you've had a persistent cough or a temperature, then your data will be held for 20 years. But if you had none of those symptoms, but you actually had COVID, then your data will be held for five years, which seems odd to me because I'd have thought there would be at least as much medical interest, if not more, in an asymptomatic COVID patient than, for example, someone who merely had the symptoms, but uh, actually was mistaking hay fever for COVID. The other um, sort of controversial thing about the privacy notice um, is the purpose. Um, the privacy notice says that this information is uh, kept uh, because COVID-19 is a new disease and so it needs to be kept for 20 years because it may be necessary to know who's been affected or been in close contact with someone with symptoms to help control any future outbreaks or to provide any new treatments. Um, but it also says um, that um, information provided will not be used for any purpose that is not linked to COVID-19. And it, it's not entirely clear to me whether when you read those two together, you're um, allowed to keep data for the purpose of, uh, perish the thought, COVID-22 or some other similar disease that is not COVID-19. Um, apologies to those who listened to my last talk. I'm not going to talk nearly so long about apps, um, but I will say something about them. And this slide gives you a diagrammatic uh, representation of how they work. In very short uh, summary, uh, if you download one of these apps, whether it be a centralized one or a decentralized one, your phone generates what's called a key code. In other words, a jumble of numbers or letters which change at certain intervals. The initial plan was for them to change every day. And these codes are shared using Bluetooth low energy with other smartphones that have downloaded the same app or an interoperable app and your phone stores the key codes, it's collected by this method for a period of time, 28 days or so. And then you can see from the second line of the slide what the difference is between centralized and decentralized tracing apps. Those phrases can be somewhat misleading because even on the decentralized version, there is still a central database to which information is sent. The difference is what kind of information is sent to the central database. On the decentralized version, it is only the app user who becomes infected whose uh, key code is shared with the central database. And then what happens on that model is that the other users of the app, their phones are contacting the central database regularly. And when they find out that one of the codes they've collected matches with the central database, the app user will get an alert that they've been in proximity with someone diagnosed with COVID. On the centralized approach, by contrast, it would be the key codes of both the um, person uh, who's diagnosed with COVID and their contacts that would be downloaded to the central database. And the advantage that this would have given the NHS is it would have given them far greater insight into the transmission of the virus. It would have given them relational data that's to say information not just about the infected person, but also about their proximity events and how many of these proximity events 
result in further infection. And this would have allowed the NHS to improve the app and to understand exactly what sorts of contacts are dangerous ones and what sort of distances are significant and so on. However, that is all, um, if you're living in the UK, something of an academic uh, issue now because the NHS has abandoned the centralised model. Why did they abandon it? Not because of privacy issues, despite um, that getting a lot of media attention. It was because of operational problems. Uh, simply speaking, Apple would not help the centralised model. iOS apps are forbidden from using Bluetooth for long after the app has been minimised. And as a result, iPhones will not register contact events unless the user is constantly reopening and refreshing the app. And Apple have agreed to waive these curbs, but only for decentralised models. So uh, the NHS thought they had a workaround whereby Android users would sort of nudge awake the, the Apple phones, but it didn't work. The Isle of Wight trial showed that only 4% of contacts with iPhones, which had the app installed, were detected by other app users. So the future, issues for the future. Um, the uh, reason I have this picture here is because the immediate future for data protection law is more likely to involve beer than apps. Uh, the latest announcement from the government is that the contacts tracing app will not be ready until winter and isn't a priority. Uh, in fact, despite some negative uh, press articles about contact tracing, manual contact tracing, and in particular about manual contact tracers being paid to watch Netflix, it appears that they have been very active. Uh, in the period between 28th of May and 10th of June, which is uh, two weeks, they identified 87,639 people through manual contact tracing as close contacts and asked them to isolate. And it's interesting when you think of that number to compare with the data from the recent French centralized app, which is called Stop COVID. And the reports on that app was that First of all, it was only downloaded 1.5 million times, which in the context of the population of France is not all that high. And then secondly, even more tellingly, only 14 people received an alert of a, um, a proximity event with someone with COVID. And this may be because it, the app was uh, encountering the same problems as the NHS Act, uh, app had in the Isle of Wight. It may be the, the Apple problem, um, but it, it may also indicate that apps are not going to be the way back uh, from lockdown to normality as we had all hoped. So what are the legal issues? Um, well, I, I put privacy here on the slide as a, as a question. Um, the uh, NHS contact tracing app, if and when it um, comes live, is not and uh, will not uh, collect anything like as much uh, sensitive data as manual contact tracing because it doesn't collect names and addresses and contacts and so on. It, it in fact uh, collects key codes, uh, which technically speaking, if you're a lawyer, are, are personal data, um, but um, uh, not perhaps what the layman might think of personal data and certainly not as sensitive as um, the sort of data you might collect, for example, if you were um, contact tracing in relation to a sexually transmitted disease. Um, and um, it's also worth pointing out that the contact tracing apps will never um, be tracing people's location, as some early newspaper articles wrongly suggested. Um, uh, however, there is a legal challenge uh, afoot in relation to data retention. And that's why I put the second bullet point here. Um, the Open Rights Group have announced that they intend to challenge the 20 year retention period as they say it's too long and unnecessary. So uh, that is a, a space to watch. And then uh, finally, an issue that um, has only really arisen in the last couple of days. Uh, uh, two days ago, there was an announcement uh, that pubs, restaurants, hotels, etc., will be required to collect the contact details of customers uh, 
if they want to reopen uh, next month so that such data can inform track and trace. And it's not difficult to imagine the data breaches that could ensue, for example, if those institutions fail to protect the data or if they misuse it for marketing purposes. Uh, and so those of you um, with an entrepreneurial mindset may wish to reach out to anyone they know in the hospitality industry in a GDPR compliant way, of course, and offer their advice uh, on things such as privacy notices and compliance with data protection principles. Uh, so that's uh, all I have to say. And I'm now going to hand over to Tom Tabori. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope I can be seen. Uh, I'm sure one of my colleagues will message me if that hasn't worked out. And hopefully that was a, a smooth transition to my final bit of today's webinar. And um, hopefully also my screen is sharing and you can see its title there. And the title, as you can see, of this area is quite distinct from my colleagues. It concerns another aspect altogether of information law, nonetheless still part of this particularly interesting area, namely uh, mis misinformation, which is a growing uh, area in the sense of its importance uh, and its understanding and in terms of legislative attention. And that's the focus of this talk is going to be activity by legislatures, particularly in the UK, but uh, around the world uh, to deal with this with this issue. The first part, there's going to be four parts to this talk. First is the, the problem, uh, where we'll look over some of the instances of the issue. Then secondly, we'll look at the how the UK is responding so far. And then thirdly, having identified the extent to which or the shortfall by which the current measures are um, not dealing with the problem, we'll look at what other countries that have perhaps moved a bit quicker ahead on this front have done um, so as to inform uh, our understanding of what the issues are should the government decide to go further and to um, ratchet up its regulatory approach. And then lastly, we'll return from abroad to look at what all that means for the UK, uh, particularly from the perspective of freedom of expression, Article 10 of the ECHR, but of course a common law principle as well. Um, and how the current proposals, which have been slightly ignored in the current focus on the pandemic's misinformation, um, would, would fare in relation to those Article 10 uh, principles. So here we are with the first of our instances of, of the problem. Some of these you may uh, be uh, aware of or have encountered um, over the past few months. And this one in particular was the uh, false claim originating from Facebook that uh, the Gates Foundation were planting microchips during COVID-19 swab testing, uh, found to be false, uh, in case you were wondering. This was another. This was um, reported by uh, Reuters a conspiracy theory linking 5G mobile telecommunications masts to the spread of the novel coronavirus, uh, which was, of course, dangerous fake news. And in fact, the NHS's national medical director said the 5G conspiracy idea was fake news, uh, pointing out that the phone networks that were had been damaged were those used by the emergency service services and our health workers. And all disgusted that people would be taking action against the very infrastructure we need to respond to this health emergency. Another one you may have been have encountered over the past few months is the myth as to uh, garlic curing COVID-19. 
And another was, of course, not on the screen, but you may have encountered the claim as to high doses of vitamin C having been proven to have been effective treatment for COVID-19. Uh, as to the seriousness of the issue, the WHO itself, as early as mid-February, announced that the new coronavirus pandemic was accompanied by an infodemic of misinformation. The seriousness also underlined by news such as this reported by the CNN in late March that a Phoenix area man is dead and his wife is under critical care after the two took chloroquine phosphate in an apparent attempt to self-medicate for the novel coronavirus. Um, the article also pointing out that NBC News spoke to the wife who said they learned of chloroquine's connection to coronavirus during a President Donald Trump news conference, which was on a lot actually. And one can see how impressionable people are, can be in the face of these claims from developments then in, in April where it was reported that by The Guardian that the leader of the most prominent group in the US peddling potential, potentially lethal industrial bleach as a miracle cure for coronavirus wrote to Donald Trump at the White House this week. In his letter, Mark Grennan told Trump that chlorine dioxide, a powerful bleach used in industrial processes such as textile manufacturing that can have fatal side effects when drunk, is a, quote, a wonderful detox that can kill 99% of the pathogens in the body. And of course, Trump went on national TV at his daily coronavirus briefing at the White House on the Thursday and promoted the idea that disinfectant could be used as a treatment for the virus. So the seriousness has, if, if further quarter were needed to, to see the extent of the problem, was also shown by statement by a senior US State Department civil servant, Leah Gabriel, testifying to Congress that Russian proxies were behind swarms of online false personas spreading coronavirus falsehoods. So that's the end of part one. That is the problem, which you will be, I expect, well aware of because it's become such a, a news story. In part two, we're gonna look at how the UK has responded so far. First of all, the NHS, uh, took its own action and unveiled a package in March of measures to battle against coronavirus fake news, working with Google, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And later that month, the government announced that specialist units across government are working at pace to combat false and misleading narratives about coronavirus to ensure the government, the, sorry, the public has the right information to protect themselves and save lives. And they mentioned the Rapid Response Unit, which has been operational since 2018 uh, within the Cabinet Office in Number 10, tackling a range of harmful narratives on, online. And the government backed advice uh, from the Centre for Countering Digital Hate, who were running uh, fake news uh, assessors um, and the, and the on the slide, you can see the advice that was circulated. But then three months later, the Center for Countering Digital Hate put out a report um, this month, beginning of this month, stating that in, of the 649 posts flagged and reported by their volunteers, only 9.4% were met with meaningful action by the websites to whom they'd reported um, the fake news, the misinformation. Uh, they stated this is simply not good enough, the reporting systems are not fit for purpose, too much of the debate about the enforcement of terms of service is about algorithms and automated detection, but even when social media companies are handed clear cases of misinformation, we have shown that they lack the will to act. And a selection for you from an appendix where they collate some of what they found is this particularly extreme example of a a post that was um, present on social media. Then lastly on um, the this part two, the response thus far, it seems to me particularly notable uh, as someone following this area, working to an extent in this area, that um, Damien Collins MP, a former chair of the select committee for the that shadows the DCMS, who 
put out the 2019 report on dis disinformation and fake news, which I'm mean, coming back to uh, in part four, asked the Secretary of State for health to add a misinformation offence to the, what was then the coronavirus bill. And this is the excerpt from, from Hansard stating people who seek to use social media to spread malicious disinformation with the particular purpose of undermining public health should be in a position where they have committed an offence. We should make it an offence to spread misinformation about coronavirus where the underlying in intention is to undermine public health. And he referred to um, examples going on abroad. So at the end of this part two, to, to recap, the context is of existing me measures not controlling the mischief, fact-checking not stemming the tide, and the hovering question is thus, what more should be done, and what are the legal implications if we do? Um, as, and as Collins' intervention shows, the global nature of the crisis invites international comparison, which is what I'm going to do in part three. So at one end of the spectrum, is the Singaporean example, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, even before the pandemic, the Singaporean government had uh, enacted the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulations Act 2019, though this year its information minister has held that the coronavirus um, justifies its approach, um, given what has developed since. Section 7 of that act makes it an offence to do any act uh, in or outside Singapore to communicate in Singapore a statement knowing or having reason to believe it is a full statement of fact and that it's likely to be prejudicial to public health, public safety. And anyone who breaches the offence or commits the offence is liable for an enormous fine varying between 50,000 for an individual and um, 1 million if done by an inauthentic online account or a bot is used to communicate the statement. Um, notably, um, Section 7 doesn't apply to any act carried out for the purposes of the provision of an internet intermediary service. So this doesn't challenge by this legislation, Facebook, etc. And so whilst Singapore may be known for this approach, and it's famously low ranking in the global index on censorship, um, its example has, has really caught on, and it's uh, by far the only country to take this approach. For instance, in Nigeria, a bill has been tabled which essentially entirely uh, replicates the Singaporean 2019 Act. In Hungary, um, this section 337 of the Criminal Code was enacted making it an offence to spread misinformation, um, again with the same five-year maximum sentence. Uh, Hungarian journalists have said the new law will make objective reporting of the pandemic harder and leave them open to facing court cases or even jail time for their reporting. And in Russia, uh, a federal law was uh, passed in two days, that is two days by one day with the legislature and the next day Putin uh, approving it, which um, creates the offence you can see set out there, namely creating a new coronavirus fake news offence. Closer to home, in France, quite recently passed a fighting hate on the internet law requiring social networks to remove certain hateful and illegal content within 24 hours. I add as a ancillary point that this doesn't directly seek to control um, coronavirus misinformation but did very much use uh, as a matter of politics the spread of the disinfodemic um, as justification for this increase in powers and extending regulation to the social networks and it was inspired by a law that as in Singapore Germany had brought forward before the pandemic had even hit um, something called the Network Enforcement Act, um, which commenced in the beginning of 2018, which applies to social networks, unlike the Singaporean Act, and requires upon notification social networks to remove manifestly unlawful content within 24 hours and 
Failure to do so is a regulatory offence, which may be sanctioned by fines of up to five million euros. Another provision of the same Act made it a requirement to publish biannual transparency reports, and this you may have uh, heard was what was applied to and found to have been breached by Facebook Ireland Limited, who received from the German Federal Office of Justice a two million euro fine for publishing an incomplete version of one of these uh, lists, creating a distorted picture of the extent of illegal activity on its network uh, and of its action to deal with it. So as with the French example, it relies on the German criminal code and doesn't create a new definition of uh, coronavirus related uh, disinformation. But so the significance of the French and German example really is of the seismic shift to bring within scope of, of significant regulatory control the online networks, perhaps in keeping with what the European judiciary have done with Google Spain and finding um, that they are data controllers. There's of course been reaction to the Article 10 Freedom of Expression Implications. Um, Human Rights Watch in Germany saying that of the Enforcement Act it was vague, overbroad, turns private companies into overzealous censors to avoid steep fines, leaving users with no judicial oversight or right of appeal. It's been adjusted since um, and that is probably what we're going to see is that uh, legislators will bring forth regulation and it will have to be adjusted. And perhaps the most comprehensive assessment of the Article 10 implications of what's been going on around the world as governments have, have rushed to bring in this sort of legislation is in a report by commissioned by UNESCO and produced by um, experts at the International Centre for Journalists uh, attached to the University of Sheffield Centre for Freedom of the Media about the grave risk that laws designed to curtail COVID-19 and disinformation could also damage the ability of, of free and quality journalism to counter the disinfodemic and their alternative proposal is simply that Facebook et al fund the, uh, the rest of the media or uh, themselves fund um, substantially increased fake news, fake fact-checking um, services. So at the end of um, part three, um, with one part remaining, we, we s conducted this international survey so we have a sense of what the land looks like should the UK government journey into it and um, fa face down, if you like, and negotiate the Article 10 counterfoil. And here is when I where I would bring in what I mentioned before, the report by Damien Collins, former committee, the committee he formerly chaired, um, an enormous piece of work uh, conducted over some two years and building on work by his by the committee in the previous term to consider the issue of disinformation originally from the perspective of its arising in the election context, uh, namely the EU referendum, but also what happened in, in America. And it recommended a compulsory code of ethics for technology companies, similar to the broadcasting code issued by Ofcom, to be overseen by an independent regulator with powers to bring legal action against companies breaching the code. To the extent that the pandemic is a, a new development beyond that, of course, post-dating this report, the fact that Damien Collins, who of course is not the committee, but nonetheless as its chair, uh, reflects some of what the committee's views when producing this report uh, were, uh, the fact that Damien Collins made his intervention in, in the Commons suggesting something that goes even further than what the 2019 report uh, recommended, namely to create a misinformation offence, gives you some idea of what the evidential basis in the 2019 report means in this present factual context, I propose. And the government responded to this uh, and other policy considerations with a white paper, um, the online harms white paper, which essentially adopted the recommendation and proposed to establish a new statutory duty of care on relevant companies to take reasonable steps to keep their users safe and tackle illegal harmful activity on their services. And that would be overseen by a new independent regulator, which would have power to issue substantial fines, 
and the regulator would have to include certain things in this code to guide the uh, networks as to how they were to meet it. Currently, the government's considering uh, responses to its consultation on this white paper, but a draft bill has already been put forward, perhaps in frustration by a one of the by a peer, Lord McNally, uh, which contains a similar provision to this. Um, so the issue is then at, at this juncture, if the government is to follow other countries lead into regulating online misinformation and the freedom of expression question is engaged, what is the analysis? What can we look forward to uh, in terms of how it should be greeted? Well, as to scope, uh, whether the white paper's proposals come within scope of Article 10, uh, the fact that the various posts are offensive and damaging somewhat, one might say, given what we've seen from the WHO and the NHS, doesn't mean that they would not be protected by Article 10. So there's a classic statement from Lord Walker and Williamson that in matters of human rights, the court should not show liberal tolerance only to tolerant liberals. And in terms of the common laws approach to the same issue, uh, the same would be the case. So before Human Rights Act 1998, you had um, the case of central independent television where Lord Hoffman stated, freedom means the right to publish things which government and judges, however well motivated, think should not be published. It means the right to say things which right thinking people regard as dangerous or irresponsible. The freedom is subject only to clearly defined exceptions laid down by common law or statute. And it is this fact that it comes squarely within Article 10, however heinous, that means that the detailed analysis that this talk here is barely a uh, initial consideration of, and when the statute comes forward, when the bill comes forward, if it does, the analysis can move forward. But it means the fact that a justification will have to be made means that um, it's worth getting started and looking ahead to how the matter has been greeted um, abroad. Um, we have got some indication of how the courts might consider it in the UK from a recent decision from the Divisional Court in this year, in fact, in the case of TV Novosti and Ofcom, the Office of Communications, where the Divisional Court rejected a challenge on grounds of Article 10 to a decision by Ofcom to impose a £200,000 fine on a Russian corporation that held a license to broadcast the RT television service in the UK. The fine was imposed for breach of the broadcast code's impartiality provisions. And significantly, given all we have from the government at the moment is the white paper, the Divisional Court considered the white paper that preceded the 2003 Act. The court stating, there is nothing to suggest that the need for accuracy or impartiality in the broadcasting media or the contribution that an adherence to those standards in broadcasting makes to a properly informed democratic debate has diminished or is any less important to safeguarding the interests of citizens now than it was at the time of the white paper or the enactment of the 2003 Act. Indeed, there is reason to consider that the need is at least as great, if not greater than ever before, given current concerns about the effect on the democratic process of news manipulation and of fake news. So as I wind up my final part in this talk, um, what I submit this shows is that the model recommended by the DCMS report and inferable in the government's online harms white paper corresponds uh, and would benefit from the same finding as to there being a pressing social need for purposes of justifying any restriction on freedom of expression Though, of course, the proportionality question would uh, have to be considered on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. And I can see Rory's come back, so I know I've taken um, a long time already, so I'll, I'll wind it up there, and uh, if anyone has any questions, um, please, um, ask me. Tom, thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm just going to suggest that we, we take a couple of questions that have come in so far. Um, the first one was about, in fact, uh, education, health and 
care plans from, from local authorities and because that's I suppose a little bit where I was talking I'll, I'll try and address it but the question was whether or not local authorities can outsource EHCPs with full identifiable details and health details of each child to meet deadline dates. Um, seems to me that, that there are quite a lot of layers to that question. I mean the, the without um, turning this into a, a talk on local government law on the hoof and on the fly. Um, my understanding of EHCPs is the obligation to produce them is on the local authority. So the whole question of what you mean by outsourcing in that context is quite important because ultimately the responsibility to uh, produce and to uh, maintain these plans is that of the local authority. So I think I'm right in saying that although you might want to make arrangements for contractors perhaps to carry out some of these obligations you've got to make sure that ultimately it is the local authorities um, document and plan so there's got to be an approval process and outsourcing in that context could, could mean a lot of different things but it can't mean delegating the responsibility for uh, creating this plan to people outside of the local authority. So that's um, a slight observation sort of cantering into local authority law. But from the point of view of the, the GDPR, I mean, the, the issues for me would seem to be about the processing requirements. I mean, there are obviously um, exemptions under Article 92H for social care processing, but you've also got to read them with Article 9 three, which is the one which requires that any such processing for these purposes is carried out either under the responsibility or by or under the responsibility of a health professional or a social work professional. In other words, or, or people who are under the same obligations of confidentiality. So what you've got to start thinking about is all the steps that would mean that processing decisions are fair and lawful if outsourced and are under the proper regulatory control, particularly the proper requirements as to professional obligations or law of confidence. So you know, it, it's not a sort of unequivocal no, but plainly there are a lot of steps that you need to go through so that simply doing it to meet deadline dates in a rush might be potentially quite a difficult uh, issue. Um, right, that's, uh, I, I hope, an answer to the first question that was posed. I think the, the other questions that were posed, I think, um, really relate to a lot of what Tom was saying. So in particular, Tom, we were being asked whether or not there was a risk that one person's legitimate questioning of the efficacy of the government's response to the pandemic is another, perhaps the government's misinformation. So, you know, who's the judge of what's misinformation, I suppose, lies behind that question. And and can regulatory controls be misused? Yes, um, I think that's, that's the obvious lesson. Um, perhaps it's common sense, and perhaps I took the long way around by going around the world to, to gather that, but it's, it's very clear that handing over control over to a um, bogeyman ministry of truth is going to run into serious uh, difficulties. Um, the better approach may be at least, given that proportionality will be the test, to begin with what is set out in the online harms white paper, uh, and if it's insufficient, then ratchet us up further. I can see a, another question by uh, an anonymous attendee as to whether the government will create a statute making misinformation a crime. Um, I don't think so. I don't think I've missed something where it's been enacted. I may be completely uh, incorrect, but that there's been so much development in terms of coronavirus legislation proliferating. Uh, I may have missed that. I don't think I have. And I would doubt that now it would come forward, partly because I assume the lesson has been learned that I think is the lesson from the examination, uh, partly because we've hardly seen the government rush into enacting what it's already got tabled in its white paper, um, and partly because, touch wood, we the high point of the crisis and the R rate is, is on the uh, decline. So it won't be this um, set of facts and this uh, moment that as in France in May, 
led to the creation of these regulatory um, offences. However, just lastly, that may be simply to store, store up the issue for the election context where the analysis began uh, and is not going to go away. So um, it may be that we see the matter reconsidered now, but in relation to coronavirus and the disinfodemic, I would be extremely surprised though, as I say, it may exist and I've simply missed it. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, we've been online for just over an hour now, and I'm sure that there are people who'd be dying to escape into the sunshine. Um, Tom, I think, has finished on an optimistic note about the R note, the, the R um, level receding and the pandemic receding. So um, perhaps at that point, we will say goodbye. Um, thank you very much, everyone who's listened to us. I hope you found something of use in what we had to say. And as I said at the outset, we'd be delighted if you had a look at the Chamber's website and found other webinars that might uh, be of interest to you. So thank you. I'll say goodbye from myself and ask my colleagues to say goodbye as well. Goodbye. <laughs> All right. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs>